back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the 2 o'clock block here on Community Matters. And we're talking about uh, trying to make sense of this year's uh, legislative session. And the official title of the show is Drama in the State House. <laughs> Colin Moore is an associate professor of political science at UH Manoa. Um, he's been on the show before. We really appreciate him coming down because he can offer some answers to some very difficult questions about this session. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Colin. Pleasure to be here, Jay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what do you think? I mean, this, this has been A, unusual, but B, not unpredictable. What do you think? No, not, not unpredictable. I mean, I've, although I've heard people describe this as Game of Thrones, Hawaii style. <laughs> right, right, just right, in right. case folks don't know, um, Jill Takuda, the uh, very powerful chairwoman of the uh, Senate Ways and Means Committee, and Joe Suki, who's sort of a legend in Hawaii politics, about 85 years old, and he was unceremoniously forced to resign his position yeah. as Speaker of the House. I mean, all these things are somewhat unexpected. Um, we are a one-party state. I mean, Democrats don't, in Hawaii, don't tend to like these uh, internal battles to spill over into the public. And a lot of this was driven by the fact they had to make this very difficult decision on rail. And the two houses disagreed. They're both in, in horrible fights with the mayor and city and county of Honolulu. <laughs> and they ended the session this time without even singing. They just banged the gavel and went home. I don't think that's ever been done in oh, the history really? of the state. I yeah. Oh, yeah, that's really, that hurts. They, they are <laughs> genuinely mad at each other. Yeah. But the problem is, uh, you know, I mean, I, I have the, my distraction theory. I, and I say, you know, well, we're going to go and do this, but then we get distracted every day. And, and fighting in the legislature is a huge distraction because you, how can you concentrate on policy? How can you actually talk to your constituents? You know, Congress is not dissimilar. How can you talk to your constituents and get the right message so you can make the right analysis if you're mad at everybody and fighting with everybody? And can you imagine all the meetings and conversations and email that went to dispose all these people, um, I'm sure they were spending their time on that rather than Oh, and, you know, and the public knows this. I mean, this does nothing to increase trust in government. But when you have an issue like this, uh, like rail, that sucks up all the oxygen in the room, I mean, all of these other very worthy bills, and we had a lot of them this session, there's just no time to consider them. We don't have a full-time legislature. Yeah. They only meet for a very short period of time. And so everything else is deferred, or um, it just doesn't make it through committee. And so there's a lot of really potentially helpful pieces of policy that they don't get heard because they're too busy fighting with each other. And, and you know, the other thing I'll add to that is a lot of these fights aren't so much over policy or, or ideology. Um, a lot of the, I mean, why, for example, Takuda and Suki lost their seats? I mean, some of this just has to do with the fact that people felt like they violated the norms of the legislature. They weren't being appropriately deferential to their colleagues, and, and they needed to be punished as a result. Punishment. It happens. Yeah. There's so many ways you can punish somebody in the legislature, and it happens all the time. And again, that's a distraction from good policy. You know, I think so. And, and you know, Jill Takuda, I, I mean, I've heard her criticized by legislators who say that, you know, she, she, she didn't um, consult them enough. And, you know, I think what finally, this, what, what finally, I think, convinced some legislators that she needed to go was this agreement with Sylvia Luke to use the hotel tax instead of the extension of the GET. And the reason the senators were so angry about it is not so much the policy, although there's reasons to you know, debate both sides, it's that they were caught off guard, and that is an unforgivable sin. Mm -hmm. um, they want to be consulted well in advance. They want to have enough time to hear out their constituents, hear out major industries like uh, the tourism industry. Um, and for them, you know, that, that was it. Um, the fact that they saw her as betraying the Senate for the House and not giving them enough advanced warning. Well, there are some sea changes going on, and I'm, I'm irresistibly drawn to the uh, parallel between what happened in the health care bill, uh, the Trump health care bill a couple of days ago. I mean, they, they, didn't even, they didn't have to text. Yeah. They didn't have to text. How could they pass a bill without having the text? And they didn't have any hearings. They got no information, no testimony. They don't have they, a score no from the Congressional Budget Office, which you know, normally would have been essential for a bill like this. And the public is going to react. I mean, it's not just the New York Times, you know, chumming the waters, and they will. <laughs> but, but it's, you know, the public in general is going to be excited when this gets to the Senate, and we'll see what they can do about it, if anything. Uh, but I think there's a, there's a parallel running, don't you, federal and state, where, A, there are people who try to not disclose, not, not, not consult, not give information, not get information, and people who don't like that. And that tension seems to be coming up now 
now in this session, this administration, and now in the, in the well, we'll see in the Hawaii State Legislature as well. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not as extreme here as in as Congress, but you're right. I mean, this this is a shift to a, a permanent campaign, right? Where the only thing that matters are the optics, and how it will play politically, <laughs> how it will affect the next election, yeah. and that means that the ability to create good public policy is almost gone. I mean, look, the health care bill. Almost everyone agrees that it's frankly a piece of junk. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not going to solve many problems. But in the Republicans' case, they just couldn't go back to their constituents and say, you know that bill we've been complaining about for seven years? We're, we're going to let Obamacare stay. It was unacceptable. And on, on the state level, right, the, the people are, I mean, people in Hawaii feel like they already pay too many taxes, and legislators know that they're going to hear about it. So most of the time, they spend blame shifting. You know, it's hard. It's the city council. It's the mayor. It's the senate. It's the house. But someone's got to pay for this project at the end of the day, and someone's got to take responsibility. And that means all sides probably should take some lumps. But we've got to come up with a financing package that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and that and that's still that in itself is still the top of the iceberg because we have like forty billion dollars of unfunded liabilities coming down the pike. We have sea change coming down the pike that's and right. climate change. Um, we have all kinds of expenses we're going to have to get involved in. Some of them we know, some of them we don't know. We're not in good financial shape in general, rail or no rail. Yeah. And so who's watching the store on that? Was it Sylvia Luke and, and uh, 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 Takuda um, or, or maybe nobody? Well, I mean, so you, you raise an interesting point. I mean, rail, rail is just a, a small part of the picture. And I think, I mean, Takuda and, and Luke were... Um, we're able to work together really effectively. That that was important. And you know, I, I don't want us to do this whole show and, and think of it the, the entire 2017 session as a, as a negative. Because one example of where Luke and uh, Takuda were able to work together was on tax reform. Actually, they they passed a very nice uh, tax reform bill that reinstates the top tax brackets, but then gives the earned income tax credit to some of the state's lowest earners. Well, that's that's a, going into effect next year. Yeah, that's a that's a good piece of public policy, um, and that was something they succeeded on. The press hasn't covered that much, um, but you know, but that was. That was a help, but but there are other big issues that you suggest, right? All of the unfunded liabilities, the massively unfunded state public employees retirement system, uh, the state public employees health care system, uh, affordable care. I mean, there's not really been a serious, I mean, not affordable care, rather affordable housing. There hasn't been a serious effort to address that, which is always the number one issue people care about. Yeah, and I mean, I suppose it's it's not hard to make the conclusion that one of these days, these things are going to surface, and there'll be a brick wall out there. And the question is, how will the legislature deal with them going forward? Um, uh, I, I think we've seen a sea change um, over the past few years. As I say, this is not unpredictable, that this sort of process, this sort of the argument thing and failure to look at the big picture thing, failure to plan, uh, has been happening in a while. And, and it's sort of erupted more than before this year. But where does that put us on the long-term continuum? Are we going to have this again? Have we changed our culture in the legislature so it, it's permanently dysfunctional? I hope not. I mean, this was a particularly ugly session. But, um, but there does seem to be an indication that they're just incapable of dealing with these bigger problems, that the answer always is, well, we'll, we'll consider it next year. We'll consider it two years from now. Um, you know, don't, don't come to me with these difficult problems where I might have to make somebody angry. Um, and, you know, I, I thought at this time, I mean, because they had to come up with the money to continue to fund rail, that the urgency of it would force them into a compromise. The fact that they adjourned um, in this, this chaotic ending, really with, with nothing, it doesn't give you much faith that they'll be able to deal with even harder problems. What do they do um, when they face a crisis in the public employee pension system? That's even more expensive. It's coming. It is coming. It's absolutely coming. So if they can't solve this problem, it doesn't give you much faith that they're going to be able to solve problems in the future. And this is even more discouraging because one thing you think you might gain with a essentially single party state, right, where they're very unwilling to do things out in public, right? Joe Suki sort of notoriously suggested this last session that, you know, we don't we don't like to air our dirty laundry in public. We, you know, the party keeps everything inside yeah. and, and we, we are in our problems together. Well, yeah. you think that would be one advantage of having a one party state, but all Democrats, I mean, there's not a single Republican in the state Senate, they still couldn't come up with a bill uh, to fix rail. Well, uh, you suggested before the show is that maybe they'd be better off if they had a, a two-party system. Well, you, 
Uh, I think that's right. I think that's absolutely right. But how right. do you get there from where we are? This is, a, this, is a, this is a great PhD thesis, isn't it? Right. How do you get there from where we are? What steps do you take? It's, it's very, very difficult. I mean, you know, one option would be that the Republican Party here is reinvigorated. I think that's extremely unlikely. I mean, they're, they're always going through their own internal uh, wars, um, you know, between the, the hard right and the Hawaii Republican Assembly. And you see this with Andrea Tupola running for, um, for state chair. chair. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, really the Hawaii Republicans' problem is that they're dragged down by the deeply conservative mainland party. I mean, they might be able to kind of position themselves as a bit more libertarian, offer an alternative to what a lot of people think is a, um, you know, entitled and corrupt uh, Democratic Party here. But it's tough for them to do that because I sort of call it the southern accent problem. I mean, people are deeply suspicious of the mainland party because, you know, they think it's full of southern racists. Um, that may not be fair, but it drags well, it them down. It may be fair, yeah. too, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the alternative is, is you could get some sort of more public split in our local Democratic Party. And you saw a bit of that with the Hillary Sanders um, divide in the, in the nomination. Maybe a third party like the Green Party, although that's very unlikely. So we're, we're a little bit stuck. It's hard to imagine how you, how you get out of this. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's any easy solution. So that factor, which has to be a factor that led to this inability that we have been talking about, um, is, is not going to be changed, probably. Right. And so that we won't, we won't have a solution there. Is there any other solution? Is there any other way? I mean, for example, suppose I give you a really strong, articulate, ambitious, well-educated, thoughtful leader, and he says, follow me, boys and girls. Uh, let's do it this way, and here's some policy things you, you know, and if you're off, off the page, I'll tell you. Um, would this help? Potentially. I mean, um, I mean, people have been wondering where Governor Ige has been in all of this, and I think he probably, rightfully, at least politically, it was a smart move to stay, <laughs> to stay out of it. Um, but, I mean, Abercrombie tried uh, maybe a more charismatic, forceful style. That didn't end very well for him. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, people have legitimate concerns about some of his, uh, his decisions. But, um, you know, you could imagine a younger legislator. But again, in Hawaii politics, look, I mean, I'll take the Republicans as an example, right? They essentially kicked out two of their more articulate younger members, or at least forced them to resign and change in the Democrats. In a nasty Democrats. way, I might Look add. at Beth Fukumoto. I mean, yeah. she's smart, a talented legislator. She didn't really want to leave the Republican Party, I think, unlike Erin Johansson. So she was, but she was bullied until she finally left. It does and not reflect you well on them. You can't eat your young if you want to succeed yeah. well, as a party. Because other young are not going to come around. Yeah. No, and well, that's it. That's the lesson you get, is that if you're a young, ambitious, smart politician, even if you have conservative leanings, the answer would be, well, don't join the Republicans because there's just it's clearly the message. Yeah, and, and even Linda Lingle, who was able to you know more, make it more centrist, uh, make it more appealing for the local voter for a short time, she uh, essentially abandoned party building when she got in office. Yeah. So the result was what she had built in the in the campaign fell apart. Yeah. When she got right in after office. right after she left. That's yeah, right. That's, that's really right. too bad. So, you know, you mentioned that David Ige, and, um, you know, he hasn't really gotten involved in this. Uh, and query, uh, you know, maybe he would get it. Maybe he'll have a special, special session on the rail issue. That'll be interesting to watch. But uh, do you think he will? Do you think he will? Um, well, the legislature could call it themselves, which I don't know if that's ever happened, but that may be uh, what he forces them to do. I think mm -hmm. two-thirds can, can call their own special session. Um, but I suspect that he's going to have to. I mean, he will look like he is completely absent if, if he doesn't take some leadership. And, and that may be what's needed right now. I think the governor might need to knock some heads together yeah. and say, look, you, you've got to stop this squabbling. This has become an embarrassment. We might be in risk of risk of losing federal funding, and you know that I doubt that'll happen. But it's not, um, you know, it's not a non-trivial matter. I think you'll recall a couple, a few weeks ago, right? Ben Cayetano, former governor, wrote, took out this huge a Washington ad, Post yeah. ad <laughs> encouraging the Trump administration to take a second look at rail. And it's unlikely, but hey, Hawaii has no, been no friend of the Trump administration, so uh, he <laughs> might not take much. He, he doesn't wake up in the middle of the night, write checks to us. <laughs> <laughs> he, read, he sends tweets to yeah, us. Yeah, exactly. But what about, what about David Ege? I mean, you know, event after event, he's been missing. You know, issue after issue, he's been missing. And the only thing you can say is he's made some deals with the unions who mm -hmm. will support him next time around. But, you know, where does this leave him? Whether he calls a special session or not, I mean, it's, it's hard to deny that um, he, isn't, he isn't there. 
and he hasn't helped it. Uh, so query, what, what does he look like right now as a potential for the next term? Well, I mean, so I'll say that Ige is more or less governing the way he always said he was going to govern, which was that he thinks these decisions would be left to the legislature to work out the details, and he's been, he's been hands off. Um, I mean, sometimes people want a more charismatic, involved governor, and then when they become more involved, everyone says, oh, no, no we, didn't, we didn't really mean that. Uh, we want to work this out ourselves. But for his reelection, I mean, the truth of the matter is there's no one to run against him, or no competitive candidate really has has arisen to, uh, to challenge him. I think that would actually be good, it'd be healthy, it might force him uh, to take a little more active role in some of this because that's the only way to hold him accountable. Um, I mean, I don't think he's done a terrible job, but yeah, I don't, also don't think he's done a fantastic job. Um, so, but there's really no one to run against him. He seems to have pleased the unions. Um, certainly the teachers uh, got a pretty good deal. It looks like the cops and the firefighters got a pretty good deal. Um, and if you want to succeed in Hawaii politics, uh, you know, staying out of battles and making sure everyone gets paid is a, is a pretty successful strategy. <laughs> it doesn't lead to good public policy that might bankrupt the state, but it does help you get reelected. If you keep doing that, though, yeah. you end up being an outback yeah. backwater. <laughs> Let's take a short break, All right. and then we'll come back and we'll talk about how this affects the public, how much they're engaged, and how the media is covering it. We'll be right back with Colin Moore. I'm going to the game and it's gonna be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink but won't be drinking today cause I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line. Keeps them from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way cause it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you wanna be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that says let's go. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Okay, we're back with Colin Moore on Community Matters. Uh, we're talking about drama in the State House, and uh, I'm trying to make sense of this year in the, in this year's session. So, you know, what, I think one of the things uh, that I would like to know, to discuss with you, um, is how the public reacts to this. Because you know, we have a certain amount of pervasive apathy, mm -hmm. even in drama. Even with drama, we have pervasive apathy. Why is that? What are the roots of that? Uh, how does that affect what they did or didn't do? And um, how does what they did or didn't do affect the public the view of it? All right, so kind of a three-part three, three question yeah. here. Um, how do all these things interrelate? I mean, it, it, it feeds on itself, right? I mean, the, the public doesn't pay a lot of attention to politics. Well, first, because, you know, frankly, I think at the core, it's because a lot of the public doesn't even know anything about it. I mean, you have to kind of have a basic vocabulary to follow this stuff. I mean, you can't watch a sports game if you don't know the rules. And uh, <laughs> at this point, I think our civics education has become so bad that a lot of younger people simply have, have no idea how any of this even works. So, so that's one We're problem. not alone in that. Yeah, we're, we're not. Just sweeping the country. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, the second thing is, is that I don't think they think that what they feel really matters. I mean, that the legislature will decide one thing or another, that special interests have too much power. Whether or not that's true or not is an empirical question, but, um, you know, that's, that's the perception. I mean, part of that perception is fed by the fact that, you know, really pretty much every incumbent gets reelected every year. There's not that many tight races, not that many competitive races. And the reason you need that stuff, it's not just be so folks like me who love politics can follow it. It's because a competitive two-party system, competitive elections mean that you get serious debates. You end up really talking about what matters. You end up being forced to make difficult decisions. You end up being responsive. I always say that, you know, a scared politician is a, is a responsive politician, <laughs> right? You want them to be scared. Um, but they're, they don't really feel like they have to deliver, and I don't think the public feels like they're delivering for them. I think they feel like they deliver for certain core constituencies. I feel like they think they probably deliver for some public employees here in Hawaii, but um, they don't deliver for everybody. And I think, why would you pay attention to something when, you know, it doesn't yeah, seem like you. anyone much cares what yeah, you think. Yeah. 
Um, you know, what, what does the public in Hawaii care about? I mean, the number one issue really is affordable housing. Every single poll, that's what they care about. Um, you know, people have decided that the rail needs to be built because it's halfway built, but what they care about is finding a way for them and their families to stay here. And the ledge kind of works around the edges, um, does a few marginal shifts, but the truth of the matter is, you know, giving folks a tax break on, break on their grocery bill or building, you know, a few more units of workforce housing, that's really not going to address the problem. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think they, they don't feel, perceive that the legislature has the same sense of urgency that, that they do about some of these issues. In all of that, I mean, it, it sounds like, and, and maybe this is a sea change all around the country, but it sounds like people are interested in, in self-interest, and businesses are interested in self-interest. Even nonprofits are interested in self-interest. And, you know, who is watching the vision that we are to aspire to? I gotta say, in the energy you know, field, we've had a couple of bills with targets and 100% renewable. Whether we actually make progress in that is a big issue to me. Um, but I think mostly we don't have a plan. We don't have a self-image as a state. Mm -hmm. If we had a self-image of a state, we'd have more than one airline. Yeah. We'd, have, we'd have ferries back and forth. Um, you know, we'd have, we'd have better energy right now. Um, yeah. We don't do that, and we've lost touch with that somehow. That's, that's exactly right. I mean, was it, was it George H.W. Bush who called it, or Bill Clinton who called it the vision thing? I mean, we, we, the state doesn't have a vision anymore. It seems willing to simply make sure everything sort of runs together, uh, but we'll do the basics and we'll kick the can down the road for these more difficult issues. And, you know, the interesting thing about that, or the sad thing to me, is that this state was really born as an innovative place for public policy. I mean, it prided itself on the 30 or so years, maybe 25 years after statehood, of being a leader for the nation. You don't hear any of that anymore. I mean, a lot of what you hear is excuses. A lot of what you hear is, well, we can't do that. It's too complicated. Um, you know, that's the sort of policy issue we don't want to engage with. And, and maybe a little bit around energy, you've got this. But clearly, as you suggested, there's not really the, the sense that we need to go to the distance. That, that we can do radical things. We can really be a leader in public policy. We can be excellent. We can be excellent. That's right. The sense that we should be excellent is gone. The sense is that maybe it would be good if we were in the top half. I think that's that's sort of what it's been replaced <laughs> yeah. as with. As long as we're not embarrassingly yeah. low. Exactly. On exactly. <laughs> it's like it's like you know we become we went from being a, a you know an honor student to a to a B minus student. We're not terrible, but that's about all you can say. So. How does that happen in a given place? And uh, you know, if you don't mind my multiple compound questions, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if we understand how it happens, is it reversible? Can we change it? And if we can, how? Ooh. Well, I, I hope we can. And you know, one thing I'll say is there's a lot of younger, talented legislators. Um, you know, I'm thinking of people like Chris Lee, of like Della Bellotti, um, who really do need to be given a chance, who really care about public policy. They're really smart. They're not afraid to take some risks. Um, and those are the people we need to have in charge. I mean, the truth of the matter is, and you know, I hate to say this because, you know, Joe Suki served the state for a long time, but there is a lot of the old guard that needs to realize that they should retire or that they should f find ways to mentor some of the younger politicians Amen to that, and give Colin. them leadership positions. I think that's so important. And it's not limited to government, it's in business, too. Oh, absolutely. You know, all these guys sit around like you know, until they're way octogenarian. It happens already. at the university. Yeah, it does. Um, I mean, I think that's one of the most difficult questions that people don't always um, spend enough time thinking about. How do you? How do you plan for succession? And you want to do it strategically. You want to do it um, so you get the right sorts of people in these positions. And I think that's, I mean, if there's an action individuals can take, I think that's that. If you're the sort of of retirement age, then you really should be thinking about you know, how to shepherd young, talented people into these positions of leadership. Well, but it's dangerous to run for office. Yes. It's dangerous because whatever happened in your life is going to be turned up against you, and even if nothing happened in your life, it's going to be turned up against they'll you. They'll find something. <laughs> they'll find something, and they'll, they'll make it up, you know? And you're embarrassed and humiliated, and, you know, you're, you're in shame already. Um, and a lot of people, you know, they won't touch it. And I know people who are totally qualified who would run, but that stops them from running. And I don't know how you change that. Maybe that's the press thing, or maybe it's a public attitude about, hey, he's running. He's a good guy. He wants to help us. He's not just doing it for self-interest. How do we change that way of looking at it? I wish I knew the answer. I mean, clearly there was a time here where that, those movements were embraced. I mean, if you think of the younger people, um, you know, like Neil Abercrombie, like Ben Cayetano, like Joe Suki, I mean, people who were elected in a much earlier era, they, they were young. They were the ones who were here to change things. And, and folks gave them a chance. 
and that's what we need to do again. Give it a chance, you know. Yeah. Re respect the respect the essence of what he's doing. Mr. Smith goes. Was it Smith? Yeah. Mr. Smith goes, goes to, to Washington. Washington. He's got an idealistic approach. If you find idealism, the rest will follow. <laughs> yeah, you need. I mean, you need to combine idealism with some older folks who understand how how you know how how the sausage is made. I mean, that makes the best organization. But yeah. when you just have a bunch of old cynics. You're not going to. You're not going to accomplish yeah. anything. Yeah, we have to let let the young people in. Yeah, em embrace them and en encourage them and uh, empower them. So, question though, what's going to happen next year? Because we've seen now the sea change. We're not happy with it. We're not sure we have a solution to it. Uh, all things equal, what's going to happen next year? We, those bills going to come back. It's an election year. You know, people are a little timid in election years. Uh, are we going to have a re resolution of these issues, or it's just going to be like you know off the side, never to come back? Well, there's going to be a have to be some resolution to rail. Um, so I expect there's going to be a special session. I expect probably the GET extension is what's going to happen. Um, and so that issue may finally be dealt with for good, and that can be taken off the agenda and leave some room for other things. So I mean, for sure you're going to see Airbnb come back. That's a really emotional, tough issue, issue that wasn't dealt with this session. Some of the environmental bills, which were good bills, like the... Um, uh, the sunscreen oxybenzone ban, that'll probably come back, maybe styrofoam. I know a lot of the younger legislators were really frustrated uh, that some of those environmental bills weren't looked at seriously this session. What about uh, physicians' help, uh, medical help and dying? That's an interesting bill. Well, you know, that's, that's a really important bill. I think everyone thought that was going to happen this session, yeah, including did. me. Yeah. Um, and the truth of the matter is I don't, I don't think it's going to come back next session. That's an election year. Um, too if it was going to pass at all, it, was, it would have been this one. The problem is that bill is the exact sort of thing our, lo our local legislators don't like to touch because you, there's really no room to compromise. At the end of the day, it really is a philosophical question. Um, and, and someone is going to feel like you've done the wrong thing. And it's a very emotional issue. Um, but, but this is their job. I mean, they're either whatever side you are on, um, this is the sort of decision they're elected to make, and they need to make a decision. Just saying we're going to consider it again is not a decision. No, kicking it down the road doesn't work. That, you know, that takes me back to Next Era. Next Era lasted 18 months while mm -hmm. it was going on. It was casting a shadow over everything. Everybody was afraid to move one way or the other way. And I said, look, decide one way or the other. Decide. Just be done with it. Get it, get yeah. it behind us so we can do other issues. Otherwise, the distraction will be total. And I mean, I worry about that happening next year, too. Uh, you're right, though. If we resolve it in, you know, quickly, uh, then we'll have time for better policy elsewhere. Well, <clears throat> so what, I, I wanted to ask your advice, if you don't mind looking at camera one. Uh, they're <laughs> out there. The media is out there, okay? Yes. And am I, you know, you do these, you know, uh, these visits with the media on a regular basis. You, you know, to your credit, you come down from the university and give us your thoughts and your analysis. It's very valuable for the public to have that. But query, uh, and you deal with the media, what should the media be doing as, as a member of this whole establishment um, that takes us forward, that takes public opinion forward? How should they be looking at it? How should they look at this session? How should they look at the legislature in general to give us a better result? There's camera one. Well, I, I think for the most part, given our, our limited media outlets in, in Hawaii, they, they don't do a terrible job. But one thing I would suggest is that they do focus more on policy, on the sorts of things that people care about, and less on the horse race. I mean, the, the, the Takuda ouster, Suk, the Suki um, um, ouster, that got a tremendous amount of attention. And other important policy issues really weren't covered. So I think it requires a certain amount of discipline um, from media outlets to say that we're, we're not going to play the legislators, legislature's game because those are the kind of distraction issues that, that they would like to have focused on um, and not the issues that I think matter more to the public. It's harder to tell those stories, but they're more important stories to tell. So, Yeah, it's a conversation. Yeah, It's an ongoing conversation. You have to be honest. You have to tell your views. You have to be open to the other guy's views. Uh, the media, the public, the government, everybody involved, and the university, and you and me, it's a conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for My this pleasure, conversation. <laughs> Always nice to see you, Colin. Take care. All right. <laughs>